For those dialing in or just dialing in, welcome to our May Pharmacy Access Office Hours. Excited to have you all on. And I know it's been a couple months we've not had one. Um, conferences, trainings happening in between. So we're pleased to have you all here and we're excited about uh, our upcoming presentation. Okay. All right, folks are still chiming in, but um, in an, in an, you know, effort to stay on time, I am going to go ahead and get started. It's two o'clock now. Um, our session is recording and welcome to those who are just dialing in and um, we'll let everyone else uh, continue to chime in. <clears throat> Thank you to our panelists for dialing in and I don't see their names, so I'm assuming some of them are possibly our policy team. So we'll get to you all shortly in our presentation. All right. Welcome everyone again to, if you're just dialing into our pharmacy access office hours for uh, our May session, uh, we're excited about, you, hopefully you saw our emails a couple weeks ago, we're excited about um, a, a more or less a series of um, uh, topics expanding on the clinical pharmacy or advanced practice services in a community health center. We are so excited about partner, partnering with um, uh, El Rio Health and, and Holyoke Health Centers and uh, so that they can present the work that they're doing in their respective organizations. All right, give me one second so we can. Okay, you all know our mission. I'm not gonna read through all of this uh, for NAC. You all are very familiar with our NAC mission. Again, just some webinar logistics. Of course, you can, thankfully it's working now. So feel free to ask questions, pose questions. Throw some comments in the chat box uh, while we're doing the presentation. Tim and or I can uh, facilitate getting responses to you. Certainly, if you have any technical issues, um, just let us know in the uh, chat box. And again, those slides, uh, slides and recordings will be published to our NAC 340B archives webpage, and we'll provide all those links to you after the session and certainly as soon as the recording is available. And of course, you're on the Noddle Pod pages, 340B Access, our advocacy page, as well as the Pharmacy Access Office Hours group uh, on Noddle Pod. Reach out to me and or Tim uh, to get access to that. Right. Again, this is fairly funded. All of our um, activities are fairly funded for an office hours is no different. Uh, in particular, we are prohibited from discussing anything related to advocacy in this forum. Just uh, you all familiar with that disclaimer. So today's agenda, we're gonna, again, like we always do, offer uh, some 340B developments and updates, kind of let you know where we are in that um, landscape there. Certainly gonna do, we're gonna provide a program alert. Uh, there's a new technical assistance document that uh, we are in the final stages of uh, refining and that will be out for publication in next month in June. So just to give you a heads up, Tim will talk a little more about that later on. Um, and, and today, the, our focus topic presentation is part one of the series uh, focus looking at clinical pharmacy or advanced practice services in a community health center. And of course, Q&A at the end, but you can always, always pose your questions uh, during the presentation and we'll try to get to those as soon as possible. So what we're gonna hit to next, I just wanna double check the chair yet and or Jeremy or Matt, are you guys on? Just wanna make Jeremy's sure. here. Hey, Jeremy. Yeah, I think Vashari is working to get in. So, okay. And Matt is um off this week, so it's gotcha. just Vashari. Gotcha. All right. Let's see here. Move on to her slide, and uh, hopefully Vashari can jump. Hey, on. yeah, Brandon. I was going to offer um maybe if you want to have me go first, please. Um, okay. Yeah, hold on. All right. Um, yeah, can you go to, I think I've got a slide in here. Uh, she just gave me the that one, so. No, 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 I think I, there should be one. I, um, did you not get mine? I'm sorry. I, I did not. I did not. Shoot, I'll tell you. All right, bear with me a moment, everybody. I will just pull up right. Can I share my screen? Is that you okay? Sure, you sure can. There you All go. right, hold on one second. The beauty of technology, right? Amen. Bear <laughs> with me, everybody. Uh, Around there. 
Um, what am I doing here? Hold on. What am I doing? All right. Share screen. There we go. All right. Can everybody see this slide okay? We can. All right. Now I'm going to go to full screen. Great. Does that make it? Does that make it full there screen, everybody? I may want to change it to your, this, change it to the presentation display. It's the display settings up there. There we where go. Am I, where am I going? Oh. Dis display settings and swap it. Top one there. Good. Not sure what's going on, but we'll we'll work with what you get got there for hey, now. <laughs> how about, what, do you, what do you see now? Do you see the slide? This is showing in your, um like the notes type of presentation. All right. All right. Well, I'll dive right in. It's fine. Know. All right. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. And I, I know I've presented to you all before, but uh, just a reminder about myself, Jeremy Crandall. I'm the director of the what is now, um, it's not official yet, um, but we'll be the, the federal and state uh, policy team. Um, but we still have a federal affairs team um, and, and Vacheri as well. Um, we're just going to uh, more uh, oversee the policy development side of both the state and the federal issues. And really the name's just more to reflect the work that we do because we also do some federal work. But um, so I just wanted to bring folks a up to speed a little bit um, on what's happening at the state level. And I will tell you that the slide on the left is already out of date. It's slide on the left, excuse me. The um, map on the left um, is already out of date uh, because there's been some action in a number of states in the last couple of weeks. But um, Long story short, here is the deal. So, um, as many of you, many of you already know, there is a ton of activity right now um, at the state level on prescription drug issues and prescription drug reform. Um, most much of that activity center, centers around pharmacy benefit managers, um, how their rebates are handled, how they're um, overseen by state governments, insurance commissioners, and such. But one of the specific areas where there's been a lot of activity related to us and 340B covered entities is related to anti-pickpocketing measures. And, and those anti-discrimination and anti-pickpocketing measures have been folded into larger um, pharmacy benefit manager reforms or have been their own standalone bills um, as well. But there's really two messages I wanna convey to you all. The first one um, is that be paying close attention um, to the larger, um, hold on, Brandon, is my, am I still having issues with the slide here? I just saw somebody. Yeah. It Get your slideshow and see if it'll uh, watch it, why it's not. Hold on. Does that solve the yeah. problem at all? Yeah, it comes up and then it goes to your, I'm not sure why it's doing that, but sorry guys, we can, we'll get those slides folks, to you all. Folks, I'm, slides, so. I'm trying, I'm trying everything I can. How about, how about now? Did that do it? It's, there it is. There it is. All Stay right. there. Yeah. All right. I'm not touching anything. I'm trying folks. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, what I wanted to emphasize is this number one, if there is, not if there, there is, I'm sure in all of your, all of the states that you all work in, active prescription drug reform efforts, whether it's related to PBMs, another big effort is to establish um, prescription drug transparency measures, whether it's for, for pharmaceutical companies, insurers, or PBMs, or all of the above, cost review commissions, there's absolutely a lot of activity on coupons and cost sharing. Um, and really what I wanna keep emphasizing to all of you is that with all of those vehicles, there is absolutely an opportunity for offensive measures on 340B, but also defensive as well. And so the main piece, number one, is that just be paying attention to these bills um, as they're coming up. One of the pieces of advice that, that I've been giving, if it's not directly related to 340B, think about whether there needs to be something in there about 340B that's gonna protect um, what we're trying to do there because there is so much activity just in the last six months that it is clear as this field continues to evolve, 340B is gonna, is gonna be on the menu for positive or for negative. And so we really wanna be paying attention to it. We are also um, through the rest of this year and then into 2022, gonna be engaging with a number of state-based, national state-based groups, um, National Academy for State Health Policy, the National Council for State Legislatures, NCOIL, that's insurance legislators, the NAIC is insurance commissioners. Here's why those groups matter. And I know that a lot of you may not be super familiar with them, but here's why why they matter. Um, these groups meet regularly when states, especially when states are out of your legislative sessions. Um, and I will, I will get to the map in a second. Um, here's why those states matter is because 
those those groups meet regularly to plan and learn more about policies that are going to be coming down the road um, at the state level. The insurance commissioners is a great example of where they hear policies and then ultimately they go back to their states um, to adopt what they're hearing. And so what we are trying to do throughout the rest of this year is go talk to many of these groups about 340B because prescription drugs is at the top of the list for all of these groups and it's really important that they know what's going on there. Um, next, current 340B action. I talked a little bit about all the state level activity on anti-pickpocketing, anti-discrimination. Really at a core level, what many of these bills are designed to do um, is prevent pharmacy benefit managers, especially from discriminating or otherwise treating three covered, 340B covered entities in a different way or in a discriminating way um, compared to non 340B covered entities, whether that's applying additional fees or treat, just generally treating um, the program differently than they would other um, uh, essentially uh, partners in, in the uh, that, that collaborate with uh, pharmacy benefit managers. The question about the map on the left, um, what this map is and a hat tip to the Kansas Primary Care Association, this map shows all the states that have seen recent 340B, act, excuse me, uh, 340B anti-pickpocketing action. This is not up to date. I really want to emphasize if you are in a state that is not colored in, but you had recent action, it's because this map is a couple of uh, weeks out of date. But the reason the colors are what they are is because the red is showing states that are either a combination of governor and or most likely their state legislatures as well, being Republican controlled. Blue is obviously the opposite, Democratic controlled. And it's really trying to convey that a lot of the action on 340B at the state level is in red states. Um, and so, um, you know, prescription drug reform does not know, you know, a political side. Um, I will tell you, you know, some of the state legislators that are most engaged on um, reforming PBM practices are uh, are Republican le state legislators, and so I just want to wanted to bring that to your attention. But just generally, what we are continuing to do is track what's happening at the state level on 340B. Um, we are here to help. I know that we're not going to talk about the advocacy piece and letters of support, but just generally, we're going to continue to provide technical and policy assistance. A big hat, to, hat tip to Tim Millette, who's on here. He really has been doing the lion's share of that grunt work, uh, supporting all of you. But here's the last message I want to convey before we go to the regulatory side. It is so important to let us know what is happening in your states. Um, I can tell you that some of the other folks in this field, whether it's on the national PBM front, the national drug manufacturer front, they are absolutely coordinating across states to try to get the same language, excuse me, health insurer as well, to get the same language that benefits them introduced as many states as possible. And so it is really, really, really critical that we all be coordinating. Obviously, each state is going to do what it needs to do, but the more we can coordinate and the more we can make sure that the best language possible is getting in in as many states as possible, the better off we're all going to be. Um, and we are especially looking forward to 2022 because this map, as you can see, is not even halfway filled in. Um, and we really want to try to build towards even more action for the rest of the year and into 2022. So, Brandon, I'm going to stop there. Vasheri actually popped in my office because I think she couldn't get it going on her computer. I presume you want to present here. Um, but do you want me to pause um, or or do we keep going and then take questions? How would you um, like I, I, let's pause in, in the effort. Like stay on time in the chair. I got your text too. <laughs> um, sorry about that. I'm going to pop my screen back up so you, we can see Vicharia's uh, slide, and we'll let you go from there, Vicharia. So no, keep going. Not questions. No, yeah, no questions right. for now. We'll let Vicharia go. Praise the Lord for the vaccine and Jeremy being in the office today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. WebEx <laughs> did not want me on here today. Um, <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. So I just have two updates in the 340B space that really have happened in the last two weeks, and there's even been more action today. Um, so on May 10th, HRSA submitted a proposed rule to the White House Office of Management and Budget, which is the office that's over regulations in general, um, to rescind the implementation of the executive order on access to affordable life saving and medications. This is also known as the EpiPen insulin um, executive order that happened under the Trump administration. Um, and so this is a great step because it shows that number one, this executive order and this final rule that has been on pause. So when the Biden administration took office, um, he delayed this rule for implementation until July 20th. 
And so NAC has been monitoring to see what the agency was going to do. So this is a great step to know that HRSA has this on their radar. Um, the only thing I would want to caution folks on is just that even if HRSA rescinds the final rule, which was implementing the executive order, um, the administration, only Biden, from what I really understand, only the White House can rescind the underlining executive order. And so as long as the Trump executive order exists, HRSA will still have to do something with this regulation in some form. So the one that they brought, the one that was put forward was the one that said, um, you know, low income is defined as up to 350% of the federal poverty level, which was clearly, um, you know, a depart departure from other definitions of low income uh, based on other federal programs. So we're hoping that even if HRSA does have to move forward with another regulation, that it at least will align more with the health center program and not be based on the misinformation um, of saying that, you know, health centers are charging patients all this money for insulin and EpiPen when we know that's not the health center mission, nor how health centers operate. So want to put this on your radar as NAC did meet with uh, the Office of Management and Budget on Monday to uh, strongly encourage them to rescind the rule, but also stressing the importance of the underlying executive order needing to be rescinded too. And so we hope that the White House will take additional action in between now and May 20th, or um, when we see this proposed rule to rescind the final rule, we hope that the White House will take the additional steps to completely make this problem go away. So we will definitely keep you all posted. Um, as we haven't seen the proposed rule yet, it's still sitting, it has not been published. Uh, second thing I wanna flag is that last week, or was this last week or was this this week? It, that was this week on May 17th on Monday, HRSA's acting administrator um, sent six letters to pharmaceutical manufacturers acknowledging that after they reviewed their policies and the actions that they've taken over the last uh, eight or nine months, that they have been in violation of the 340B statute. And so this was a great step for HRSA as in taking additional actions to say that um, covered entities include contract pharmacies and demanding that the manufacturers start shipping drugs immediately. Um, and so the manufacturers also have up until... Um, June 1st to let the government know how they plan to move forward, how they plan to work with covered entities and also remedy um, or give refunds to the covered entities that they have overcharged. And so it is a good step um, knowing that, you know, HRSA kind of has been sitting and has not acted on the complaints that have been filed over the last, you know, eight or nine months. So we are happy to see HRSA taking action. However, it's still the jury's out on how the manufacturers will engage and will respond to HRSA. I saw already today because there are three, um, there are three uh, lawsuits against the administration from three manufacturers, Sanofi, AstraZeneca, um, and Eli Lilly. Today, AstraZeneca uh, presented in court asking that they needed a stay in their litigation because of the letter that her suggest sent um, out um, as telling them they have been violating the 340B statute. So that's something we expected, knowing that there's active litigation about this, especially about the contract pharmacy issue. We figured that the manufacturers would use this litigation route to slow it down or to say they don't have to respond to the government by June 1st because um, they're in active litigation. So the court... Uh, set a deadline where we should know by tomorrow where the court stands if they're going to require um, the if they're going to require the manufacturers to move forward regardless of this demand letter or how they view this. So this is actively happening and playing out now. But I think the the crux of the arguments on both sides is about contract pharmacy. So at the end of the day, I think. The result of all of this, of the communications from HRSA, the six letters, and also the litigation is there should be a bright line on contract pharmacies are covered entities. We know that's where the government stands, and that's definitely where NAC stands with our health centers. So we will keep you guys um, posted on how this evolves, but it's just good to see HRSA taking actions in the 340B space as we are waiting for other things and, and waiting to see how they will enforce um, the civil monetary penalties if the manufacturers do not comply. Great. Thank you so much, Vicharia. Um, I am going, in the interest of time, I'm going to continue and move on. And guys, if you have questions, please feel free to post those in the chat. And also with the chat, um, I'm sharing my screen, so I can't really see what you all see, but I'm hoping that you all can click on that chat bubble and it pops up with, uh, with an option to type something in that chat because uh, while uh, the chair is updating, I did ch check our credentials to make sure everyone had access. So you all should be able to chat. So if that's still an issue, just let us know. 
Again, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, the chair, for those uh, updates. And again, post questions if you have any. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to make this really, really quick. Um, Tim, if you can just do like a minute kind of uh, update it. on this and we'll move on. Okay, thank you. So um, what we did, we took the toolkit that we had for um, how to, to work with the fact that manufacturers weren't shipping. We have put it together in a really nice document. Max done a wonderful job. We've also put some updated language about the fact that the letters were sent out. Um, this will be a nice tool. It's the same tool, but it should be um, more attractive and easier to use um, as far as how to deal with the facts manufacturers aren't shipping. Um, so that look for in June, um, something Brandon and I have worked on and I think you're really going to like. So that will be available. I did want you all to know the chat room, unfortunately. Um, folks, you can ask questions to us, but not to everyone. And we will continue to work on that and uh, try to have that fixed for next month. Great. Thanks, Brandon. We'll figure it out, guys. <clears throat> All right. So the, you know, the highlight of today's uh, session here is the focus topic, session one on clinical pharmacy and our advanced practice services in the health center. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop sharing and hand over to our presenter, Marissa Rowan, who's a, Associate Pharmacy Director at El Rio Health. So let me stop sharing and I'm going to hand it over to you, Marissa. Okay, whenever you're ready, Marissa. Okay, can you hear me? I can and we see your slides. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. We're so excited and I want to make sure that the audience knows that there's actually three of us today that are presenting and we're very honored to have this opportunity. Um, very quickly, just so you know who we are and a little bit about our background, um, the three of us includes Alyssa Puya. She's a PharmD and registered pharmacist who was a uh, 2019 graduate of the University of Rhode Island College of Pharmacy. And upon graduation, she accepted a post uh, graduate year one PGY1 residency position at Holyoke Health Center in Holyoke, Massachusetts. As part of her residency, she participated in a grant program sponsored by NAC. Uh, to address vaccine hesitancy. And that's actually how we got to know each other, was through that opportunity. Um, so now as a clinical pharmacist at Holyoke Health Center, Alyssa provides medication therapy management and other clinical pharmacy services to Holyoke Health Center patient population as one of two bilingual pharmacists on staff. She is also involved in the precepting of pharmacy students in their final year of training at Holyoke Health Center, as well as three PGY1 residents. Alyssa's interests include vaccine hesitancy, cultural competence, and type 2 diabetes management. Also joining us from Holyoke is Alexis Delagano. Um, she's also a registered pharmacist, PharmD, and a graduate of University of Rhode Island College of Pharmacy. Uh, in 2018 and completed her PGY1 residency at Holyoke Health Center in 2019. After residency, Alexis was hired on as a clinical pharmacist at Holyoke Health Center's sister health center site known as Chicopee Health Center. And that's where she was able to expand clinical pharmacy services to match Holyoke Health Center's um, model, which was included but not limited to hospital discharge follow-up visits, medication therapy management, vaccines, and a collaborative drug therapy management in hypertension. Alexis is also a preceptor for students and residents at Holyoke Health Center, and her interests include diabetes and hypertension management, as well as transitions of care. Um, I'm Marisa Rowan. I am a registered pharmacist, PharmD, and certified diabetes educator. I work for El Rio Health Center. I've been here for 18 and a half years. 10 of the 18 and a half years were on the Pascoyaki Reservation, where I worked at an El Rio satellite clinic providing intensive pharmacist-based diabetes management through a collaborative practice model that does include prescriptive authority. Most recently, I've served in the capacity of Associate Pharmacy Director for Advanced Practice Services at El Rio. I received my PharmD from the University of New Mexico in 1999, where there was a strong emphasis on rural health initiatives and integration of the pharmacist into the healthcare team. My residency training was here in Tucson at the Southern VA Healthcare System, and that opportunity provided an experience that further strengthened my desire and ability to provide direct patient care services in an advanced practice model. Prior to coming to El Rio, I worked as a clinical staff pharmacist for Banner University Health Center here in Tucson with cardiology and cardio 
cardiothoracic surgery teams. I also serve as a volunteer clinical faculty for the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy, as well as AT Steele University School of Osteopathic Medicine. So that's us. And again, thank you for this opportunity. This is session one of three, and um, we will all be speaking and addressing our, uh, our participants the next uh, few sessions. So jumping into it. There we go. So what should you expect as a participant? And please, we encourage you to stay until the end. But today we're going to really focus on the time that we have together, staffing considerations, as well as practice models to help answer that question about what do I really have and what is possible with our current team. In June, we're going to talk about the role of data in um, advancing your clinical services and measuring clinical outcomes, and also some very specific detailed service considerations. And that will be with the overarching goal of that early implementation and then the operational considerations that many times seems overwhelming. We'll try to give you some real life examples about how to overcome those. And finally, in June, excuse me, July, what we will do is um, with the overarching theme of how do we manage and maintain this momentum, we'll provide very specific details about payment and funding that we've explored and been successful with, as well as speak to the opportunity of growth, as well as sustainability, and the whole concept of layered learning within your health center and organization. So now okay. I'm going to hand over to Alyssa. Hi, guys. So first, we just wanted to touch about a little bit about our health centers at a glance. So as Marissa said, she's um, out of Arizona at El Rio, and we're here on the East Coast in Massachusetts. So we're a geographically uh, two diverse health centers. The El Rio patient population is certainly larger than Holyoke, as you can see, and encompasses more clinical sites as well as more in-house pharmacy sites. Both. Um, in-house pharmacy teams, though, do fill a large prescription volume each year and have a large number of pharmacy staff. So we hope that this goes to show that kind of regardless of uh, your health center size or the number of clinical sites, these services can be implemented in a variety of locations. Can you want to talk about what are the pharmacy? Well, you see that name, what does that exactly mean? And sometimes there's other names for it, such as advanced practice service. Uh, we can't really hear Alexis very well. I think we lost audio with Holyoke. Is that any better, Brendan? Uh, do it one more time. Give me one more. I think I heard anything. This is Alyssa, but I'm not sure that you can hear Lexi well. Yeah, I can't hear Alexis. Can you hear me now? Just very muted. It's very muffled. I know you mentioned that you're in the same room. Alexis, would you be able to um, swap seats with Alyssa? Yeah. Yeah, hang tight, everyone. Thank you, guys. Got my mic. There we go. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. No worries. Thanks okay, so, so um, clinical pharmacy services, um, we wanted to make sure that everybody knew kind of what we were talking about in this. Um, presentation. Sometimes it goes by a couple different names, such as advanced practice services or even ambulatory care. Um, so I have a definition here by the American Pharmacy Association. I won't get into it, but really what we're doing is um, providing direct patient care through medication management with our patients. Um, a lot of this involves patient education, teaching them how to care for themselves, self-management, um, working with the patients on chronic disease state management, like hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol. And um, these things that we can provide are provided in a couple of different practice models, which we have on the next slide. 
Um, so today we're going to talk about four uh, main practice models. One would be the outpatient pharmacy, so that can be in-house or a uh, contract pharmacy like CVS or Walgreens. Um, you can also provide clinical pharmacy services through direct patient care, so in your health centers directly in those clinic sites. Um, there's also an option to be like a hybrid pharmacist that kind of goes in between outpatient pharmacy and clinical pharmacy services, which we'll explain further. And then uh, teaching in academia, so partnering with your local um, college of pharmacy so that you can kind of provide those services through that. Next slide. Okay, so I think you're going to talk a little bit more about what um, outpatient pharmacy exactly is. So I mentioned contract pharmacy, which would be your Walgreens, your CVS, your Rite Aid. Um, and then in-house would be a pharmacy inside your health center. So here at the Holyoke Health Center, we also have an in-house pharmacy, but we didn't always start that way. We did start as a contract pharmacy um, through a local pharmacy, Lewis and Clark. So if you have a contract pharmacy um, through your health center, what that can help you do is provide revenue through 340B savings. Um, this, through these pharmacies, it's not as much as you can get through an in-house pharmacy. So if you had one in your own health center, but it does provide some savings that can help you start or promote clinical services. If you do have an in-house pharmacy like we do here, um, you can get more revenue through these 340B savings. You can also provide um, outcomes, which is an MTM or medication therapy management platform. Um, you can do CMRs or comprehensive medication reviews, um, targeted intervention plans or tips, and those things can help you connect with those patients and get that direct patient care right in that pharmacy. This also helps your Medicare star ratings. Um, we also can do medication adherence packaging in your in-house pharmacy. Not every in-house pharmacy may have this, but that's something that we do have here. That helps increase your script volume and um, increase your patient's adherence and overall health. Um, we also do provide vaccines via standing order in our in-house pharmacy. Contract pharmacies can also do this, but um, in this way that we're able to improve the quality of care right in our health center. You want to add anything with that? I was just going to say, um, I was just going to add that outpatient pharmacy is often seen as a way to kind of get some revenue and use that revenue to then promote your other services. So as a pharmacy starting out or as a health center starting out, um, it can be a big undertaking to start an in-house pharmacy, which is often why the contract pharmacy is a good avenue to take. It's a little bit less of an undertaking to get that up and running, but it can generate some revenue that you can put into your other services. Versus if in-house is always something you want to do and you're ready to take that step, um, it comes with more revenue from 340B savings and thus more opportunity to invest that funding, um, as well as the opportunity to have touch points with your patients, offer the adherence your packaging, like Lexi said, and really start some clinical or advanced services. Um, the outcomes is an early version of that, as well as uh, vaccines or standing orders. In addition to vaccine standing order prescriptions in our pharmacy, we also have standing orders to write for emergency contraception and Narcan. So pharmacists, based on that agreement, can write the prescription. We do all the patient counseling. I think we're ready for the next slide, Martha. One of the things that I'll add as we transition into this next slide is one of the really important things about what Alexis and Alyssa just mentioned. And I know not everybody on the call is a pharmacist, so we're gonna over message some of these things probably for the pharmacist participants and it may be new information for non-pharmacists. But being creative in those funding sources and why we're talking about things like 340B is really important when you're talking about this next section because there are not currently abundant ways that pharmacists can engage in order to receive direct revenue. So unlike physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, where there's very clear and defined revenue sources, our profession as a whole continues to um, struggle with that. And so that's why some of these things that we're gonna talk about on this slide, as well as what was just presented on the last slide, really are the jumpstart ways that many of, program, many of the programs like ours are able to start and sustain these clinical uh, lines or advanced practice services. Um, so on this side, it's, I love the way that, and 
all credit to Alexis and Alyssa for this. Um, I love the way they put it together, right? So what you'll see in blue is services that are provided or unique to our model here at El Rio. Orange would be what's unique to Holyoke and green would be the things that we both have felt work well for our, our two different organizations. Um, I'll talk very briefly about El Rio and then transition over to the Holyoke team to talk about that and then we'll compare and contrast the green. So with the Medicare annual wellness visits, so Medicare and Medicare Advantage patients uh, are eligible as a benefit and it's truly defined as a benefit for what is called um, wellness encounters. So the first one would be the first year of enrollment, which is known as the welcome to Medicare year. And then after 365 days of enrollment, you shift into this annual wellness visit model. And so um, although there's different regulatory issues from state to state or when you're in a FQHC versus outside, are you considered an educator? Um, and you know, how does your organization choose to define educator? Um, there are some technicalities around this model, but it can be quite effective. And so in the context of an annual wellness visit, the pharmacist role would be, uh, for example, in our model, to interact in a tandem model with the primary care team, which could be the physician or um, nurse practitioner themselves or their defined uh, care team to offer this benefit service to the patients where you're looking at things like home safety evaluation, fall risk, but also a huge focus on being able to interact with the patient that has Medicare or Medicare Advantage and focusing on the medication regimen. So is it safe? Is there, um, is there anything that should be overcome like cost? Are they at risk for entering the donut hole and could we make a more affordable regimen? And or are there things that could be on the beers list, for example, that could be contributing to safety concerns, specifically falls, confusion, memory loss, at home um, because their medication regimen isn't necessarily the most appropriate for them. And then of course, it's always on our radar as pharmacists to consider deprescribing. So overall, the goal and the role of the pharmacist in these visit types would be to address medication adherence as well as safety, um, accuracy and appropriateness of current regimens, and then build in those other elements that are important for overall health of the patient um, as they age. Uh, chronic care management is something that we also do here at El Rio, and we were talking, uh, the Holyoke team and myself, about the similarities and why one of us went MTM and the other has gone CCM. But uh, chronic care management, also known as CCM, again, it's for Medicare and Medicare Advantage patients, but um, it looks at high-risk individuals who have two or more chronic conditions that are expected to last at least 12 months or until the death of the patient that could, if not appropriately managed, result in significant uh, death, exacerbation of their underlying disease state or decline in function. And so through this model, the goal is to spend a minimum of 20 minutes per month, which is uh, a billing opportunity and speaks to that sustainable model, but really it's to develop comprehensive care plans for these high-risk individuals and continually review, revise, and monitor the patient's progress when focusing on the management of their um, various disease states. I'm gonna hand it over to Holyoke to talk about their two specialties before we start to compare and comp contrast our similarities. So immunizations are the vaccine program that we offer in the pharmacy is one of the things that's um, unique to Holyoke. So although we met the El Rio team on that grant, looking at vaccine hesitancy, we had two very different models for how to go about getting our patients vaccinated. And in Holyoke, we found that um, the pharmacists were spending a great deal of time with patients through our other visit types, identifying vaccines that they were in need of. And we wanted to be able to give them those vaccines in the moment when they were agreeable to them. So we started a program via standing order where the pharmacist will write the prescription for that vaccine and administer it all in accordance with the CDC adult immunization schedule. And in that way, we're able to get our patients um, vaccinated. And that was the workflow that worked best for Holyoke. Betsy, do you want to talk about CDT or uh, MTM rather? Sure. Okay. So um, MTM, as Marissa said, we kind of have similar um, 
similarities between our CCM and our MTM programs where um, MTM is more of like the comprehensive medication review. We sit down with the patients, we go through each uh, medication one by one. How are you taking this? When are you taking this? And make sure that they're taking the right drug at the right time um, for the right reason and make sure there is an indication for every medication. Um, a lot of it is pa patient education where patients don't even know what these medications are for. Um, so it's a huge learning experience for these patients um, to learn what exactly their medication is for and how it's going to help them so that they can increase their adherence and keep them out of the hospital. Um, so that's kind of what our MTM services are for. Usually we do them um, like initially and then we'll follow up within another month and then maybe three to six months or a year after, depending on if the patient has kind of understood everything that we've gone over or if they need more um, disease state management along the line, we'll see them more frequently. Um, we also use our medication adherence packaging that I've talked about before to help get these patients that are doing the MTM on that adherence packaging and increase their adherence, which helps to keep them out of the hospital. So um, we do a lot more MTM than the CCM. Um, so yeah, and then we both do transitions of care and CDTM. I don't know if Marissa, you wanna start and we can kind of go back and forth. Sure, yeah, so with transitions of care, again, you know, you can have a very formal structured program or you can do it more on demand type of approach. And that's what I like about our two systems is we've dabbled in both. Um, so transitions of care, anytime that a patient is transitioning from more of an acute care setting into their chronic care management with their PCP teams, we all know that there's opportunities where things don't go as planned. And so the whole transition of care model utilizes pharmacists as part of um, an interdisciplinary team to really try to keep people from going back into those acute care facilities. And so with the pharmacist being involved in these, again, the medication focus really helps to address things that have already been brought out as we spoke about annual wellness visits, chronic care management, MTM, really using our role as the drug expert to um, use that lens and to, and to make a more safe transition for that individual. Um, so in the El Rio model, we've done it both formally, where we had people who were staffed and would be co-located with our physicians that were completing those hospital discharge visits. But over the years, we learned that really the best way to service our patients is to be on demand. And so now what we do is when we have someone who's coming specifically for the visit type of hospital discharge follow-up, uh, the team that will be seeing that patient calls over and will ask to see if one of our staff can come over and do a quick med rec um, with the patient. And so it's not uncommon, and I don't think I'll surprise anybody on the call by saying that many times a single point of contact with a pharmacist that could last anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes can identify anywhere from 1 to 20 med-related errors that could have potentially resulted in harm and or rehospitalization of the patient. So again, it depends on how complex your patient is, but that's not unrealistic to find that many opportunities to intervene. Um, now we're going to start a new model here for El Rio where we're still going to engage in transitions of care, but we're going to try to target people in the home using telehealth. And the main driver for that really is that there are opportunities to really better understand what is going on and what are the challenges facing the patients when they're in their own setting. And so many times when we were doing those on call type of consults, when a patient showed up for their hospital discharge follow up, they didn't have their medication vials, they didn't have their blood pressure cuff, they may not have had their glucometer. And I mean, who would expect them to? They just got out of the hospital. Um, so it's challenging. There's challenges, but uh, challenges we need to overcome. So by having the patient comfortable in their own home, it's easy enough to say it's okay that you. Um, don't have your bottles, your medication vials in front of you, I'll wait. And while you're up getting those bottles, collect any herbs or over-the-counter medicines that you may have. Why don't you also grab your blood pressure cuff if you have it? And so the power of having really useful information and essentially setting up those next team members that may interact with them face-to-face -face is something that we're really excited about. And so um, more to learn, because this is our newest form of how we're going to handle transitions of care. But just to give you a very quick example of how we've even tried to restructure how we do this model.
Um, and then for the collaborative drug therapy management, also known as collaborative practice agreements, this is really an exciting area. But again, you really need to know your state um, opportunities as well as uh, as barriers that might exist. But collaborative drug therapy management can be a whole range of opportunities for your pharmacists on your uh, team and in your organization. So it could be things like Alexis and Alyssa mentioned, whether it's Narcan prescribing, emergency contraception, vaccinations, those technically are forms of collaborative drug therapy management or collaborative practice agreements. You can also, in various states, go into disease state management. And we both are fortunate in our respective organizations to have things that allow us to work directly in the clinic with patients and um, manage things like diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia. Many times you hear about anticoagulation clinics, congestive heart failure, uh, COPD. I mean, it's endless, honestly. And then there's also the next level where some states will afford pharmacists the opportunity to prescribe within those collaborative drug therapy management programs. So, again, it's very different as you go across from East Coast to West Coast, North to South. But I would encourage everyone on this call, if you aren't intimately familiar with those opportunities for your pharmacist, it'd be a great place to start. Is there anything that you would like to add, Holyoke, before we go to the next slide? I think what you were talking about, Marisa, with the change in the way that you structured your TOC visits is a good point for us as well, because while we started doing those visits in person immediately prior to the provider's visit, and then we were able to give them a handoff and kind of prep them on some issues we had identified as a result of the pandemic and kind of a, a silver lining for us in the pandemic is we started to do those visits over the phone a day in advance of the provider's visit. It allows us to reach the patient while they're at home, like you said, with their bottles of medication, with their glucometers or their blood pressure machines, which they often wouldn't remember to bring in. Um, but it also allows us to draft our note and put it in the EHR, send it to the provider that's going to see the patient the next day, and it gives them some advanced time to review that note and the issues we've identified, and I think helps to bridge the gaps on those issues and those patient needs a little bit better. So that change for us was received favorably by our patients, but also by our providers, and it's something we're going to continue to do even as we kind of move out of this pandemic life. Um, our CDTM agreements, like Marissa said, we have a couple different disease states that we're able to prescribe in. Lexi's involved in prescribing for hypertension and we're expanding it to diabetes and then hopefully within the next year or so asthma as well. So these are disease states that we can um, do monitoring for, write the prescriptions for and directly kind of impact the patient's care. And we didn't include testimonials in our presentation today, but honestly, if you were to go and ask any of the clinicians that work directly with our various teams, um, it's a high level of satisfaction for those primary care providers, because we all know everything they're facing and all the different challenges that they have to address when a patient comes to them. And so having highly skilled and competent team members by your side that you know, you feel confident you can bridge them to these different services is such an amazing opportunity for your health center. Um, so the hybrid, you know, both of us, it's funny, again, we met through vaccines, but as we've gotten to know each other, this is one of the other areas where we really share um, this belief that you can have two different types of components that are essentially performing the same function, but it's in different service areas. So for us, the commonality is we have pharmacists who are trained and motivated and engaged and want to provide direct patient care services in two distinct practice settings while maintaining that they're always, that concept of always working at the top of your license. And so many times these different opportunities will allow you to bill and there's that opportunity for reimbursement of those services like we mentioned in that other slide. But the other thing is that um, we really want to make sure that we're increasing interventions that are going to elevate the level of service that the health center provides with the goal of improving patient outcomes and care um, and then also improve the satisfaction and the relationships that the pharmacy department have with their different team members in the health centers. And how we both kind of arrived at this whole hybrid concept is 
honestly rooted in how do you change your current practice or your current culture? And so knowing who your staff are and, and who maybe is best suited for these different things is an easy way to kind of um, understand why we took this on. So with honoring your long timers, you know, it is not uncommon here at El Rio to have people with 20 plus years um, at the health center. And so they have a very important role. We would never want to get rid of them, right? They are the people we are all learning from on a daily basis. Um, we have people who are here from the very first time the doors open and just retired within the last five years. And so there's so much, and it's not just about the job at hand. It's about the culture. It's about the story. It's about the mission and mission and vision of the whole community health center movement that they bring and they constantly instill in all of us that excites us to stay in this work environment. It's not by chance I've been here 18 and a half years. Um, and so, you know, things like that really, really get you far. And so how do we honor those long timers, but also recognize that when they went to school, pharmacy school, it was much different than the curriculum that's required these days. Um, and so really talking out loud to your staff about what do they see their role being in this model? How can they help support it? So will they be the prescribers? Will they be the person in the clinic sitting down conducting the visit? Maybe not. But what can they do where they're comfortable to always, again, focus on working at the top of your license to advance these kind of models and to provide the service, whether it's in the pharmacy or elsewhere, that will make us a stronger department and a more integral, um, play a more integral role in the health center and outcomes of the patient. Um, so, you know, don't, don't think that these things aren't possible because you have a, a staff that's been here quite a long time, or maybe there's a mismatch between new grads and people who are more seasoned, there's always that opportunity to do that. And so things like the hybrid model also make it less scary uh, for those who are saying, oh, I'll put my foot out there, but I can't jump all the way in the pool. Um, I just wanna dip my toe in, that's fine. Dip your toe in before, know your, before long, your foot and your leg are in there. Um, and maybe eventually you're gonna be all the way in the water. But this is really a great opportunity to think outside the box about bridging those gaps. And so don't feel like you have to go out and seek out only residency trained pharmacists or that they have to be certified, um, board certified in ambulatory care. There are unique ways that you can honor all people so that all of your department staff are working together and that alignment exists. One of the last uh, models that we wanted to talk a little bit about is teaching or academia. So both at El Rio and at Holyoke, we've seen this model kind of come to fruition in our health centers. These are pharmacists who are also professors at a local university or college of pharmacy. Um, at Holyoke, we started with a resident who then moved on to a professorship and continues to work um, at Holyoke with that being one of her clinical practice sites. And that brings some unique opportunities for us. Uh, a lot of our research opportunities at the health center come from that pharmacist and her position at the university. It also brings a lot of student involvement, which is a, a great piece of being a pharmacist and teaching kind of the next generation of pharmacists to offer the services that we offer here. So I know both health centers have a kind of teaching academia model embedded in their services. I think what we wanted to end this session with was just a little bit of an overview of how we got started. There's a lot of information to cover, a lot of services that you can consider offering and different people you can consider um, having in those positions. Um, but it doesn't have to be all at once, nor does it have to be all or nothing. So at Holyoke, at least we started as a contract pharmacy in 2001, and it wasn't until later in the 2000s, 2007 and 2009, when we opened the in-house pharmacies. And we started with just a little bit of clinical services, doing some outcomes, and then expanded our residency program. And when that first resident, like I said, went on to be a professor, that brought new opportunities to have students here learning with us, um, expanding our residency. And we've had the, been lucky enough to have our residents stay on. I've, I've been one, Lexi has one, um, to keep the clinical services going and also to expand them into new opportunities. 
So um, it just takes one change and kind of one thing to start one layer of services and then expand it to the rest. For El Rio, um, we were, you know, we opened as a community health center uh, in the early 70s. And in 1971, we had our first in-house pharmacy. Um, and it wasn't until 2000 that we really had our first break. Um, and it was the stars aligned, right? So HRSA had a demonstration project that they had messaged to the Office of Pharmacy Affairs that was specifically looking at the role of a pharmacist when added to the primary healthcare team or traditional standard team. And how could that pharmacist improve health outcomes? At the same time, the state of Arizona had adopted collaborative practice agreements that did include prescriptive authority. So we're super fortunate that that happened and that Sandra Leal at the time was working um, here in town and got things going for us. Um, in 2003, that's where I kind of entered the picture. And again, just speaking to that unique opportunity and to not think that it always has to be the traditional models of care or the traditional funding sources. Um, we do have a partnership with the Pascoyaki tribe. And so what happened is these patients were receiving services through our collaborative practice model and saying, hey, what's going on? Our tribal members are doing so much better. We see less absenteeism at work. We see less healthcare spend. What's going on? And so the tribe themselves approached Del Rio and said, we want, we want this model. We want it on the reservation. And so they fully funded for a medical assistant and a pharmacist to re replicate the services on the reservation. Again, unique opportunity. Bank of America said, what are you doing at El Rio? What's going on? We hear about this program. Um, our foundation was really instrumental in getting the work that we are doing out there and form formally publishing and speaking about the outcomes that we are seeing due to the pharmacist role when added to the primary health care team. And so Bank of America said, hey, we want to pay for a pharmacist. And so just this, you know, this whole spirit of collaboration and messaging and we want to do the right thing really served us as El Rio very well. Um, and then in 2018, similar to Holyoke, we had the opportunity to partner for a faculty position that then led to residency opportunities and the rest is history, right? So that's why we are very fortunate as our two independent health centers to talk about opportunity and being able to say yes and willing to say yes and it is that that you know self-reflection of what makes sense for us and what's realistic for us um, that's gotten us to where we are but in the future sessions we hope to be able to give you more of the nitty-gritty today was really that you know, view from a helicopter. The next two sessions, we want to get down in the Jeep and start talking about the specifics of how we did what we did. So hopefully we would give you a little bit of a teaser that makes you come back for sessions two and three, but I'm going to stop talking. I know we only have three minutes left and we want to be able to answer any questions that might be out there. Hey, thank you, uh, Marissa and Alexis and, um, Alyssa for the great presentation to get us started off. We actually do have several questions and I mentioned in the chat that we'll try to get those, um, get you guys to respond to those and get them uh, responses into Nautopod. And certainly um, we can have an email uh, list of those questions, but I will just circle around to just one of the questions, maybe of the earlier questions you guys can answer. And then uh, we'll try to close out our session so we um, don't hold folks over. But there was one, there's several questions, but let me see here. Stand by, stand by, stand by. For example, Rita, how do the, from Rita Hollenbaugh, how do the clinical pharmacists promote and engage the patient? That's a question. Same day encounter with PCP or separate encounter subsequent to visit with PCP question. Um, this could be tough per state due to who is an eligible billing provider. Yeah, so the way that our services work at Holyoke, we aren't able to bill same day as a provider. So when we were doing those transitions of care visits immediately prior to the provider's visit, we went into it knowing that that wasn't a billable encounter, but it helped bridge the gaps for the patient. And it also helped the provider who didn't have very much time with the patient to focus more on the physical assessment and that and less on making sure the meds were all set. Um, our MTM visits, since they're on a different day, we are able to bill for. And, and now that our TOC visits are on a separate day, that's also something that we're looking into. Marissa, I don't know if you want to add something. Um, one of the other things that I 
we'll speak about in our other sessions as well, but I'll just say it out loud now is that it's also really important for health centers who are considering models like this to not completely go into it with the mindset of the pharmacist needs to bill to pay for themselves. That is not going to work and it's not realistic, but really think about your value based contracts. And what do we have to gain? So the Mediterranean dollars, the things related to A1C less than nine, anything related to vaccines, anything that you have around diabetic retinopathy screening. Also, pharmacists can talk about a lot of things. So if you need them to help you to increase your mammogram rates or your colon cancer screening rates, those are all things we can easily and effectively incorporate into our disease management conversations and um, are very happy to do. And so, you know, you asked also the question um, about the, how do you sell it or how do you engage the patient? When the teams see the value of having the pharmacist on their team and how it's elevating the level of care for their patient population and also helping to offset their own workload, it's an easy sell. So when the provider says, I want you to see my pharmacist for the following reasons, the patients already are set up to be open to us. And then those warm handoffs are absolutely critical. Us walking in and saying, hi, I'm Marisa. I'm gonna see you for your diabetes management visit. I'm gonna see you for your MTM visit, whatever it may be. I mean, it makes it so much more uh, smooth and easy and successful. Great. All right. Thank you again. Thank you, ladies, uh, for this great kind of kickoff to the next two series that we're going to have. And hopefully, um, again, we'll I'll give these questions to our to our presenters so they can get their responses in. And, and Tim and I will make sure they get on Navapod, and we'll also get an email out with those responses uh, post taste. Uh, and also, continuing on to our next sessions, you you know, we'll be able to kind of uh, kind of piggyback on some of these for our next month and, and the following month session. So, again, thank you, presenters, and we're looking forward to the next two sessions. And before, um, hopefully for you guys are still on, I just want to give you a quick update on some additional resources that we have at NAC. Uh, within my operations portfolio, some of you probably are very familiar with the uh, regional operations trainings that we host every um, early spring to summer. Uh, we're hosting our very last one on the series of three. It's called Elevating Health Center Operations, or ECHO. It's going to be on June 15th and the 16th, two half days, so 12 to noon on each day. Um, it's all virtual. Uh, registration is open. Deadline is the first for the early bird. So feel free to take a look at that um, whenever you get a moment. And what I'll do is in the email that I send out, I'll make sure that link is there. Uh, you can also just Google NAC, uh, Elevating Health and Operations Training, and you'll find that registration link um, very easily. All right. Thanks again, everyone, for your participation today. I've um, had quite a bit of folks here. We know that there are some tech issues. Uh, I was messaging my colleague during the session uh, so that we can get those rectified for next month's session. So we should have that cleared up by then. Um, so we appreciate your patience. I did put in the uh, chat the evaluation link. So if you could take a moment to click on that, it's a quick little survey. Uh, I see what I'm saying. It's not working. So we'll get you the link out so that you guys can complete that uh, evaluation quickly. All right. Thanks again, everyone, for your participation. And again, we'll see you next month on the third Thursday from two to three for our next portion of the series of three sessions on uh, clinical pharmacists in the uh, care model. All right. Thank you all.